Well, uh, welcome to this uh, series of discussions and short discussions I'm having with various representatives of groups, organisations and businesses from across North Wales just to understand how they're uh, dealing with the uh, current pandemic and how it's affecting their sector. And joining me today is uh, John Gillanders from uh, the Association of Voluntary Organisations in Wrexham, or ABAW, I think, as everybody knows it, uh, which is the acronym. It's an umbrella organisation representing voluntary uh, groups across Wrexham County Borough. Uh, welcome, John. Um, Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about Avao, maybe just to start off with, uh, and also, you know, how you've had to adapt in in uh, in facing this uh, pandemic crisis. Yeah, Avao is one of the the nineteen county voluntary councils in um, in Wales. Um, as a collective, we link with WCBA, Wales Council for Voluntary Action, and form Third Sector Support Wales. Um, our main areas of operation are uh, Wrexham County, but we've obviously got links with many of the regional entities, particularly at this time with the Health Board and other partners. Um, our main role is to help and assist any voluntary and community group. We can support people with governance, we can support them with uh, funding advice, we can uh, particularly look at recruitment of volunteers and placement of volunteers and certainly with regard to COVID that's been a significant area of work that we've been doing with volunteers. Um, over the whole period we've recruited close on a thousand people to take on volunteering roles. Um, a lot of them have been around shopping, uh, prescription picking up, transport etc. But besides that um, what has really been tremendous, I think, is the amount of community volunteering that has taken place at street level and the number of people that have come forward linked with community councils or local council members or other organisations at grassroots who have actually established a tremendous network going forward. So there's been lots of adaption, not least of all is um, the use of technology more. I think everybody is now starting to learn new terms like um, Zoom, Teams and all these other things and, and networks and platforms. So that's been really interesting to adapt from what normally is very much a face-to-face -face, uh, organization meeting up with people and how we can now actually start doing things remotely as well. So lots of ways that we just had to adapt. So, so how big a challenge has been, first of all, the recruitment of the thousand people that you, you mentioned, but also the coordination of those services, because you, you were starting from a very, very low base, I'd imagine, in that particular respect. Yes, one of the first things that we did as a, um, a team, we actually created um, Team COVID in a vow, which was everybody within uh, a vow, irrespective of what their jobs were, what their roles were, we pulled everybody together and created um, a help desk system working very closely with the local authority in Wrexham and that relationship has uh, strengthened throughout the whole of the period. Um, what we uh, actively did was use lots of social media, did various kinds of promotion to recruit volunteers uh, at a time where we weren't too sure how much activity was going to take place at, at street level. Um, unfortunately, there's been a, a great number of volunteers that we haven't been able to, to place yet, and I think that's quite common across the whole of the UK, that because of the level of informal uh, good neighbourliness, if you like, that's actually taken place, and over a longer period of time, probably good neighbourliness is one of the good things. It's more sustainable if you can get people in local communities helping other local community uh, members as well. It's certainly um, identified lots of people. I think that probably in normal circumstance might have been in receipt of various services from either the public sector or from third sector organizations who have been under the radar almost to a certain extent. And it was only when lockdown started occurring and we started talking more about vulnerabilities of people that some of the problems started to come to the fore. So there's been lots of changes like that, but the number of requests for help have gone down quite a, quite a lot over the last 10 days. But what we're finding is those that are coming for help now have, have lots of other significant issues. So it's not just food and shopping they want. Um, it's more to do with, well, we've got benefits issues, we've got uh, financial problems. 
So using the network of knowledge that we've built up over the key partners, we're now actually referring a lot of people through to, to other agencies to get the, the more holistic support that they need and not just focusing on one or two areas. And is that evolution of service really going to carry on now? Because obviously we'll hopefully be moving into a different phase as we eventually start moving out of lockdown. Do you, do you see the role that you provide evolving in that respect? One of the things that we've started doing this week, and it goes on now for, for the next few weeks, we're holding meetings with uh, people at community level, community councils, looking to identify well, what, it, what can we do to try and make some of these things sustainable. What we would like to see happening is most communities establish their own band of volunteers over a longer period. So um, irrespective of what the crisis may be at any one time, it could be floods, it could be snow, uh, it could be a second wave of COVID. There are lots of things potentially that could happen where there could be a need for volunteers to react quickly. We'll be looking at um, providing some uh, options for training for people who uh, want training, uh, developing the number of people who have got DBS checks, uh, training will uh, options will be things like first aid, health and safety, safeguarding, some of the basic skills that might enhance those community volunteers. But we recently had a, an example in Wrexham where volunteers could have been called upon, but last minute they went, and that was. There were three major water bursts in Wrexham, leaving some houses without water for 13 hours. Uh, Seven Trent, who were dealing with that, actually utilised some of their own resources to start dropping off water at people's houses. They'd identified the vulnerable people. But if that had continued and there was a greater need for more distribution, then those local volunteering banks could potentially have been called in to, to assist with something like that. So. We, d we never know what's going to be around the corner where the unplanned crisis might occur at um, different levels of severity, really. And clearly, that's been a big feature of your work, getting those boots on the ground and, and that sort of um, volunteer base there to, to, to support people. But of course, another part of your work, I suppose, is supporting voluntary organisations that already exist through what are very difficult times for them organisationally, I'd imagine, in terms of fundraising and activities. How challenging is that? Um, yes, we, we've been providing some uh, general support. Uh, funding has clearly been an issue for a number of organisations where some of their funding streams might have dried up. As a county, county voluntary council, the same as the others across Wales, we've had £25,000 allocated to ourselves to give out in small grants. So that's grants up to um, £1,000. WCBA are administering a grant programme of up to 100000 um, and in addition, we're due to be receiving some money from the, the Comic Relief and Children in Need Big Night programme that was on the TV a few weeks back. We're anticipating approximately £26,000 there to be given out again in grants. But a number of the funders have also been very good adapting uh, programmes like Children in Need, um, the Morgan Foundation locally, uh, Morgan Foundation in particular, they committed a million pounds a week for a 12-week uh, period, and I think they're looking to extend that. So there's been opportunities. So we've been supporting organisations to ensure that they have access to those funds and have the knowledge. What we've also been doing to, to try and keep everybody up to date with what's been going on for the last 10 weeks, we've been sending out um, a briefing newsletter every week uh, which tends to be four or five pages. That's got a lot of the, the basic information uh, to assist organisations and volunteers as well to have some idea what's going on. Um, if anything, at times we get information overload, but it might not be in the format for people to be able to read through. So we've tried to, to narrow that, that down and focus on what we think groups and individuals might need. And um, that's been very well received generally across uh, across Wrexham on that. And you've been heading up about, of course, for a number of years. I'd imagine that this is probably the most challenging period that you've experienced. I mean, it certainly is because we, we had to do things very quickly, I think. Um, there was no pre-planning, pre um, even though we, know, we knew sort of months previously it started in China, but the lead in time for us in the UK probably to actually react and certainly at community level 
to react to what the implications were. Um, we were probably very much on the ball, but we started from, from a zero base. So we had to develop new systems, we had to develop new communications methods. All of these things were a challenge in those early weeks, but we're now almost into a, a settled in mode almost, and looking to see what the next moves are going to be. Um, I think one of the, the key things that we've got to try and get over though is people start talking about post-COVID and my, my view really and what we're saying to sector organisations is we've actually got to learn to live with COVID for a significant period of time. So what does that actually mean? Uh, lifting of the, the lockdown, it may mean some greater movement for some people but it certainly won't mean going back to where we were pre-COVID. Um, one of the key things on that as well is actually learning from what's happened. Have we developed new relationships with people, different organizations coming together in new partnerships? How do we actually strengthen that going forward? So, so would that be your key message then in terms of uh, looking to politicians and policymakers and funders in, in future? I mean, what, what would your key message be to Welsh Government, for example? I think one of the, the, the key messages is we've got to start listening to communities more. We've got to be able to react um, on the ground. The gap between political discussions and action on the ground is so great at times that um, political discussions and changes probably certainly don't react as quick as what happens um, at the community level. So sometimes uh, discussions that may be happening uh, some distance from a community may take days or even weeks to actually come to fruition by which time the community have resolved the problem. So I think we need to acknowledge and thank many of the community volunteers who have been able to do that, that they've reacted more quickly than um, the political or uh, structure has at times. Well, I'd certainly join with you in thanking those volunteers and communities and as well in thanking you and the team at Avau for everything that you've done and the way that you've managed to respond to this uh, uh, well, unprecedented. I know it's, it's said many times in the unprecedented situation. So thank you for joining us, John. It's, it's been an insight. Good. Thank you very much.